about how humanity responds to complexity. We're facing simultaneous global risks and challenges, such as geopolitical competition, demographic imbalances, political upheaval, economic dislocation, technological disruption, and climate change. All at the same time, these are not parallel phenomena. In fact, they're converging and they're even colliding. And we don't have adequate global responses to any of these issues individually, let alone taking together. And even at the national level, very few governments are actually prepared. I've chosen to focus entirely on the future, to take this COVID moment, this great lockdown as a point of departure, to look into the next 10, 20, or 30 years to what I think of as the next great migrations. What will be our future human geography? How will the eight or nine billion of us distribute ourselves around the world? And where will be the thriving societies that overcome today's volatility? Normally, I would take states or firms as the central unit of analysis. But what I've done in this book is to take individual human beings, you and me, and the other 8 billion of us. Why? Well, it's precisely because there are only 8 billion of us. You see, the world is rapidly approaching what I call peak humanity. By 2035, we may not even have reached a total population of 9 billion people. And Generation Alpha, today's babies still unborn until the year 2025, is actually going to be smaller than Generation Z. So today's youth are actually the central dramatis personae of this book. In the global war for talent, where young people go is going to determine the winners and the losers of tomorrow. Well, the relationship between technology and mobility varies quite significantly depending on geography. So for example, in the United States or Canada or the UK and France, a professional class can speak about working from anywhere and potentially shifting to the suburbs or becoming digital nomads. But that's not the case for the majority of the world population. In Asian countries, even with fast mobile broadband, people would still push into cities for higher wages, better education, access to services, and overall a better quality of life. The digital supply chain of the internet does provide economic mobility for hundreds of millions of people. It's proven to do so very well already. I've hired dozens of people from India to the Philippines whom I've never met, and I've paid them more than they would earn locally. And there's more of this happening before our eyes in the world of remote work that's allowing companies to have to be geography blind in their hiring policies. And the first step in a way to accelerate that we saw actually just as the pandemic was being priced in early last year, large banks and professional services companies began to increase their rental of office space and co working spaces in India, massively expanding their outsourcing footprint. And there's a great line about this, which is that if you can do your job anywhere, then someone anywhere can do your job. So we have several key trends kind of unfolding at the same time. The percentage of what are called location agnostic workers is rising rapidly to an estimated 40% of the global workforce and even beyond. And we have geographies that are proving either more or less capable of a coping with disruptions like climate change. And we have countries waking up to the, to the need to vigorously compete in this global war for talent. So it's the intersection of these forces and trends that will determine what destinations skilled youth are going to flock towards in the years ahead. do live in a nationalistic world, but as I point out in the book, ages of nationalism have also overlapped with ages of mass migrations. Much of the 19th century was precisely this, so they are not necessarily opposing forces. And there's often a material interest in fulfilling moral obligations, and this would fortunately be one such case, because we have a finite world population of high inequality. If we want to expand markets and achieve market scale, we need to bring technologies to people. 
and help them become active citizens and consumers and participants in various marketplaces. We also have a species level concern to maximize our survival. And to do so is going to require some fairly extraordinary actions around large scale population resettlement, without which we'll have shrinking populations and shrinking economies. And that's something that already a number of OECD countries are experiencing. So there is a clear self-interest in moving people to resources and technologies to people. But we're not going to get to this new equilibrium that we need and want if we're still governed by antiquated concepts such as sovereignty. So what I do in the book is focus on how do we evolve beyond sovereignty in a world that will still be geographically apportioned into nation states. But how do we still move beyond that into shared administration and stewardship of crucial geographies and resources and what gradients of citizenship and residency will be essential to enable greater mobility, but also to make people more comfortable with it. There are two major economies that have demonstrated a fairly robust and continuous commitment towards opening to greater migration. One is obvious and one is less obvious. The obvious one is in fact Canada. And for the last several years, in, inbound Canadian immigration has been expanding significantly. And they've set a target of at least 400,000 new permanent residents every single year. Just before the pandemic, actually, owing to the Trump administration's restrictions on H-1B visas and so forth, Canada actually took in more Indian nationals as permanent residents than the United States did, even though Canada has one tenth America's population. So in Canada, you really see this long-term commitment towards uh, immigration policy as economic policy, genuinely expanding the population and diversifying their economy at the same time. Let's remember that again, it's in the strategic national interest. In an era of structurally declining commodities prices, right? not to mention pressures to rein in the fossil fuels industry, Canada actually has to engineer a more robust and accelerated transformation towards a services economy. And it is importing talent heavily to do so. The non-obvious example is Japan, which strikes many people as a country that's very culturally insular, isolated, and anti-immigrant. That's not true. Whereas, of course, statistically speaking, the foreign population is not all that significant. There are, however, 3 million foreigners living in Japan more than has ever been the case. And what you find is that in every prefecture of Japan, there is actually a rising foreign population. And there's a lot of initiatives at the civic level and the business level and in the, at the government level to find ways to allow foreigners to make a more sustained contribution as new residents in the country. They are allocating more permanent residency. They're allowing a broader range of foreigners to own property and these kinds of measures. So you will continue to see a rising foreign presence in Japan systematically in the coming years. And it is part of what the government is planning on. In other countries, it's much more haphazard and, and volatile. But at the same time, it is interesting to look and see how uh, populism and xenophobia have actually been beaten back by the sheer force of reality. Let's take the United Kingdom. Uh, you know, if you think about Brexit and the talent and capital flight out of the UK, bad immigration policy led to a significant shortage of doctors and nurses in the NHS right at the peak of COVID. Now, if you fast forward to today, the UK has turned 180 degrees on its policy. Anyone with a degree from a recognized university can gain entry into the UK without the previous requirements, such as having a job letter, job offer in hand, or even paying a very onerous, exorbitant security bond. So those requirements are gone. So in other words, getting into the UK today is easier than it was before Brexit, right? So the lesson in all of this is that actually, populism is always short-lived, it's always a failure. It always flames out. And we are, we've seen that in the UK. We're seeing it in Italy. We're seeing it in the US. The bottom line is this. Supply and demand should always dictate migration policy. 
and it should be colorblind. When we think about how our numbers, our actual population adapts to climate change and the turbulence of geography that lies ahead, we obviously do have to set aside certain geographies as eco preservation zones and geographies that we want to rehabilitate and rewild. But let's remember that 8 billion people standing side by side could probably fit on Manhattan Island. Whereas the full terrestrial geography of the earth available to us is 150 million square kilometers. So there's plenty of room for all of us. The question is, where do we go? How do we allocate ourselves? And yes, individual countries, whether it's Scandinavian countries or whether it's developing countries are doing lots of things like planting trees and dismantling dams and trying to restore wetlands and protect coastal areas and all of those things so that people can live a sustainable life in the countries that they're in. But we have, of course, kicked off these almost irreparable, at least in the short and medium term, ecological you know, cycles of damage that will require that people relocate to the geographies that are becoming much more habitable. And the NASA forecasts show us what it, through what is called the suitability change index, the growing geographies that where people can live. And the great irony of our human geography today is that the places that are becoming the most livable, like many parts of Russia, especially Western, Central and Southern Russia, and much of Canada are largely uninhabited places. Now, the challenge of relocating the human population into these sustainable areas, which again is something that we should do morally and in our own self-interest, is of course to do so sustainably. Otherwise, you would just be creating one tragedy of the commons after another. Lots of people move somewhere, they trample on the ecosystem, and then people have to leave again. We don't want that to happen with which, as the question posits, are potentially dwindling you know, geographic resources. But we have the engineering capability, the technology today to house people in ways that are more circular, right? Where we use wastewater treatment and recycling and rainwater collection and where we have hydroponic uh, uh, agriculture, many of the other things that we can do to ensure that we have a much lighter footprint for large population settlements that we can begin to develop today. And so a large part of my message in the book is that we should be pre-designing these habitats. We have focused rightly, of course, a lot of our attention in the climate debate on mitigation, carbon capture and storage, even atmospheric geoengineering, which we haven't done a lot of, um, cap and trade schemes, you know, carbon taxes, yes. But I think we all have to be realistic and appreciate that we have, the train has left the station. Right? We also have to focus on adaptation as much as mitigation. And adaptation does mean things like building more coastal sea barriers or quite frankly, relocating more people because it costs an enormous amount to allow people to stay where they are. That's why in the US now policy is shifting pretty drastically towards not subsidizing people to return to the more or less irretrievable areas and coastal areas that are getting flooded and instead almost force them to relocate. And I think that that is, we're gonna see a lot more of that, but since we know that is going to happen, we should anticipate it. We should pre-designate those areas where people can live. And across the entire Northern hemisphere and some parts of the Southern hemisphere, there are these climate oases that can absorb larger populations. And they know, the people in those places actually know that they are ready to increase their population. And they are pre-designing their infrastructure and their habitats accordingly. And that's something that we should celebrate because it's born out of necessity, but we should also scale it. When we talk about cosmopolitanism, it's the notion of holding all people equal. And utilitarianism is about maximizing their happiness or welfare. So this term cosmopolitan utilitarianism is a fusion of these two ideas, these two ideals. The, the maximalist version of this calls for open borders and mass wealth redistribution. 
The minimalist case is for greater aid to poor countries. I do favor a large scale resorting of the global population, but I would do it in the, way, in the manner of a progressive redeployment of especially the world's youth to geographies where they can be gainfully employed. But also even in wealthy countries, listless masses of youth have been agitating in a global underclass revolt for well over a decade. And we've seen this in the late 2000s with the anti-globalization protests, Occupy Wall Street, the Arab Spring, uh, and the various movements in Europe. So I don't want to see youth you know, stuck and feeling like cogs in a machine. Instead, I want them to be empowered and be the builders of our future civilization, of our sustainable habitats, to cultivate new frontiers, to stabilize ecosystems for future generations. But if you look at the multiracial melting pots from Toronto and London to Dubai and Singapore, these are hubs of cosmopolitan identity. And there are more such places emerging or on the horizon. Think of Berlin or Almaty, Kazakhstan, Tokyo, Tbilisi, Georgia. There are more and more and more. And of course, the more young people fan out as digital nomads or looking for places where jobs are being created and new infrastructural projects, those become the next melting pots. So the more youth cluster in these and other hubs, the more cosmopolitanism as an ethos prevails. But the, the only way to actually get there towards this vision is to let people move. looking at the entire world population of today and trying to forecast where it will be tomorrow. So in doing so, I needed to look at the new directional vectors of talent. And one of the things that really caught me off guard was the rate of growth of Asian populations in Western Europe, excluding the UK. There are presently only 4 million of what I call Asian Europeans versus 25 million Asian Americans. And I predict, though, that in the coming 10 or 20 years, there will be more Asian Europeans than Asian Americans. Why? Well, Europe actually trades more now with Asia than it does with the United States. Europe is seeking free trade agreements with Asian regions like Southeast Asia and with India. And of course, Europe and Asia do share this Eurasian landmass. Europe also, of course, has rapidly aging populations and labor shortages. And its educational systems are switching towards English, and it's offering these blue cards for Asian talent. If you think about it from the supply side, Asians are increasingly confident and have a greater sense of you know, public safety and security uh, in Europe and would benefit from its generous safety nets as they migrate there. So overall, Europe is more socio-politically resilient than the US and could prove to be more attractive in the long run to Asian talent. And I see the rising Asian populations that are becoming ever better assimilated into European societies because they have exactly the skill sets, whether it's nurses or IT engineers, that European countries need.